Welcome to Cookies, the world's most influential basketball podcast. I am Ben Dietrich. Jordan Ridelli is on vacation, but Andrew Quo does not take any days off. Andrew Quo, are you as excited this episode as you were last episode, which I believe was Cookies Hoops episode 252? How do you feel about 252? Well, 252 was perfect in all regards, but I have a feeling this one might be even more perfect, if that's even possible. And that's not a slight, because nope. that's the way that perfection has to engineer it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have we have a guest. This is this is the reason why the this is the the, the pod to end all pods until the next pod. Right. You until, thought the until we top it. You thought the analysis of Israel in the last pod was good. <laughs> Just wait for my takes. Andrew, do you want to do the honors here? We welcome esteemed guest Pablo Torre to the pod. Pablo, how are you, man? I am, to channel Andrew Quo, radiating with positivity <laughs> to podcast with you both <laughs> on a podcast that I pay to get early. Oh, wow. Subscribe to Ooh. this podcast. I guess there are. Why am I preaching to the literal choir here? You're already <laughs> doing that, but yeah, I just wanted to say that I I, I truly love you guys. So this is great, wow. and and you need those takes right away. Like the the three days, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine to wait three days, but when you get them piping hot, it just hits a little different. Yeah, I want my tongue to be burned as I eat over the sink of podcast. <laughs> Yo, I ate a sandwich over the garbage yesterday in my studio, and I felt amazing. <laughs> it was great, and I, I flipped the proverbial bird towards Ben's direction, wherever he may be. Well, but this was the slippery slope that we've always discussed. Like, you are headed to eating over the toilet. This is... <laughs> Like hey, the that's... garbage is one step removed. You you were two steps removed when you were over the sink. Now you've moved to one. That is you're you're talking about one of Pablo's esteemed colleagues who we have we will have him on the pod too to discuss this phenomenon. I'm just saying, if you want to shrink your carbon footprint, yeah, we're probably all going to end up living inside of our toilet. Ben does have a point. <laughs> yeah, just flush me. I wish yeah, someone would flush me. I'm, I'm being a modernist. I'm not being judgmental. Oh, wow. Okay. This is where we're going with this. You're, you're a toilet futurist. <laughs> By the way, I do wish I had a more futuristic toilet. It's one of my many complaints that have emerged during this last period of seven months. Wait, you're... I tried... Uh-huh. I tried to get a bidet seat, right, a, right. a Japanese bidet seat, for all the reasons that I hope are obvious to everybody. <laughs> and I have a weird-shaped toilet. Mm. And I went to bidet-king.com, which alleges to have a comprehensive library of all of the various fits a toilet <laughs> can have. And my fit, apparently, is, uh, yeah, big thumbs down. So I, I, I remain in the Stone Age, just pooping and cleaning myself like a fucking barbarian. And I this... like a, I'm imagining like the toilet doctor here <laughs> giving you sort of a morose look and saying, Pablo, I got a square with you, man. You got a weird shaped toilet. I mean, there's not much we can do at this point, you know? Like, Very it's, cold it's bedside manner. Yeah. <laughs> but this bidet is famous because you've been talking about this specific bidet on the radio on Dan Lebetard's show for oh, years. Oh, he's a bidet one. You're, you're a bidet <laughs> one. <laughs> I've been trying to get, I mean, I've basically been fishing on every platform available to me for uh, someone to send me a free toilet hmm. because I have basically run into the wall of, okay, I can't use a bidet seat, so I just need someone, a toilet company, Kohler, if you happen to subscribe to Cookies Hoops podcast, um, yeah, send me a toilet. Are you thinking of becoming kind of a toilet influencer? I would love nothing more. I would love nothing more. Well, so you, I, you are doomed to eat over the toilet eventually as well. No, blessed. Yeah. You're, blessed. you're blessed. Gonna be, you're inevitably blessed to be eating over the toilet. Hey, it's it's quicker from A to B. Seven seconds or less, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I feel like here in the states, this goes 
to your, your previous toilet grievance, <laughs> we, we don't have the toilet technology that's no. overseas. And I see the vending machines that they have in South Korea. I'm like, wow, you guys have like incredible things that are coming out piping hot. I don't know, stews or something. Oh, you're talking Whatever. about food. Yeah. yeah, food. Toilets <laughs> are, are much better. As an American, you know, who was born here, raised here, I'm more and more coming to the conclusion that, you know, we're living in like a, a prehistoric state over here when it comes to vending machines, toilets, government, so many things. Well, especially when I realize like the alternative solution to having a bidet is to have like the wet wipes. Mm. And I hope you guys know what happens when a society just continually flushes wet wipes down its toilet. It creates what are called fatbergs. And they just create these giant, like, iceberg-sized uh, coagulated globs of wet wipes and all of the sewage. And they just float as one cohesive unit, destroying the plumbing of any modern society, which is mm. absolutely real if you go Google image fatbergs right now. So it's just, you're we need a better way. They're bad. These fatbergs. I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying that um, if you are using wet wipes, you are the problem. <laughs> if you are flushing wet wipes. See, this is what I'm talking about, right? That's a good we're description. Not, we're not getting better at technology. Everyone's going the other direction. We're getting back to our agrarian roots. Everyone's moving <laughs> upstate and, you know, making an orchard. Is that how you do it? You make an orchard? You just make it? Yeah, I orchard, am jealous, by the way. I, I, I will admit to great jealousy of everyone who's apple picking right now. Just living, oh, living wow. the dream. Wow, yeah. Um, did you guys read that New Yorker article about uh, honey crisp apples? And that was like an arms race for apples. Some person had developed this hybrid apple that was so delicious, the honey crisp, and he had a five year window to sell them to the market because it takes five years for an orchard to bear edible fruit. So immediately, the first day he put them on the market, people, he was on the clock. It was kind of a, an amazing story. Uh, I don't Is know. he enormously rich off of? Honey crisp apples, which is this are, like which a, are delicious. A, a honey crisp coin cryptocurrency situation you're describing? Hmm. Mm, perhaps, yeah. I mean, it was mostly a story about like all like the trappings that we talk about with technology and Bitcoin and IPOs and all that stuff applied to apples because the market has like a built-in delay. And that is just something you can't get around. Sort of like that book, Flash Boys, you know, which is a super, the last book I read, actually. Mm, we don't, <laughs> and don't I'm really. embarrassed. You're like, I'm that. good. I don't need, <laughs> yeah. I have read my last Michael Lewis book. And in fact, any book of any kind, I'm, I've reached the top of the mountain. Oh, we don't read here. No, 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 no. no. There's no reading happening here. <laughs> um, so I remember you tweeting about this and you also said, and I'm talking to Andrew here. You also said some nasty things, really nasty things about green apples. Oh, oh, those are for, those are for. Say the, it, say the, it. Who are they the, for? Who the are they outcasts for? Outcasts of society, wow. man. Wow. They're not for productive people within our functioning society. And yet you praised Red Delicious. Oh, are, yeah, those are good. <laughs> they are so mealy. Wait, That's like they're wait, like, they're oh, like okay. for feeding to snakes. This is a shopping issue, not an apple issue. If you're getting a mealy red apple, you're buying a, the wrong one, man. Red Delicious, mealy by nature. No, they're I, crispy and <laughs> sweet. Wait, I hate to bring a layer of <laughs> sincere research to this conversation, <laughs> but I thought I had read that like red apples are actually... This vast scam, a market inefficiency, if you will, what? because what? basically Get the Apple industry, <laughs> Big Apple, if you will, for years, <laughs> for years, basically preyed upon the fact that consumers wow. eat with their eyes, right? Mm. And so people expected to see red apples. That's what culture, what capitalism had taught them. And for years... Other better apples, perhaps the malign green apples that Andrew just referenced, have been going by the wayside in favor of actually objectively, scientifically, measurably less delicious apples. And in fact, wow. the red apple tyranny has been a giant problem for those who are familiar with the intricacies of apple growing. You have been on the show for under 10 minutes <laughs> and owned Andrew harder than I have ever owned him in 252 episodes. 
I we wish now I know w- he eats with his <laughs> eyes. What kind of freak eats with his eyes? <laughs> Four, four of them. <laughs> I wish I could say that that was owning as opposed to a deep kinship for someone who also has many thoughts about apples. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, Adam and Eve, clearly, who were definitely white, definitely were talking to a snake and wow. definitely Des- ate a red measures. apple that was not a pomegranate at all. What if they ate a yellow delicious? Would that change things? <laughs> but, you know, this is tied to poop because when doctors say an apple a day, mm. they're really talking about poop, aren't they? That's a good point. I, I thought That's it was dental point. fiber. <laughs> yeah, that insoluble fiber, man. But <laughs> green apples are trash. I got to go on the record here, man. They are <laughs> way too tart. And that's all I got. Well, oh, sounds like someone who eats with their eyes has some opinions on apples. Yeah, let's release the Andrew Quo tax returns and see exactly <laughs> how he's profiting from Ooh, this that's industry. That's a sad day. That's a sad day. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Honeycrisp over here. He's like, it's incredible. It's like a five-year window that's controlling my life. <laughs> I think my rankings were Honeycrisp, Fuji, Gala, Red Delicious, Red and Delicious. whatever. I love Red Delicious. Come on, man. When you get a good one from the, the, the farmer's market, it's like nectar. It is the honey of the New England. Are you guys doing some, like, orchard visits, some leaf peeping, some cider? I mean, are, 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 adults, I love that stuff. are adults doing this and not putting it on Instagram stories? <laughs> Are you guys leaf peeping without me? <laughs> I just want to know. <laughs> Are leaf peepers a cult on friends only social media? I did buy a bunch of maple syrup, so I got to out myself there. I went to the Ooh. store and spent 15 bucks on maple syrup. I have to be honest. I can never successfully gauge like peak leaf peeping from my computer at home. Like I'm in New York City. Two hours north, it's different. I, I, I honestly can't calibrate it. I've tried to you. go up for peak leaves. I go up there, it's, it's barren. It looks like acid rain devoured all of the cat skills. I can't do it. Yeah, I just keep on ritualistically clicking on the Storm King geotag, waiting for that right blend of red and yellow, and I'm just going to jump in the car that I don't <laughs> own. And, yeah, that's another problem. You have a car, Ben, right? I, I do. Yeah, that's that's... Yeah, I mean, you are within all of your automotive powers, um, a leaf peeper if you wish to be. I, I have to. It's right there. I'm slumming it. So, okay, so let's talk about that. You in the slums without your car. You're in Manhattan. So is Quo. But you're in an even less populated part of Manhattan. What is that like right now? It's super strange. Um, I live in the Midtown area, which is a sentence that. Any good listener of Cookies Hoops should, like, revolt at. Just, just recoiling. Just, yeah, <laughs> just, like, feel parts of their skin crawl. Um, and I was once like you. I true worship at the altar, as you guys do, of below 14th Street and only below 14th Street and sometimes <laughs> the Meatpacking District when we're feeling a little sassy. But I, uh, I'm in this weird dystopian, like, emptied out, no office workers. So, so I should say, as I say this out loud, some of it's good. There are no office workers. There are no real commuters. Like, it's very quiet. But the other part is you realize that, yeah, the, the great swelling of New York that occurs population-wise during the workday, because people are coming in from elsewhere, yeah, uh, Midtown is kind of the, the, if you will, the lung that can expand and contract perhaps as large as any organ. And so it's real, it's real grim. Um, you sort of see all the, to continue to torture this metaphor, which I'm trying out for the first time, you see all the tar, like mm-hmm. <laughs> you see all the, all, I'm, I'm getting the scans and it's not looking good. It just seems unhealthy. <laughs> it seems unhealthy. So well, it, the, the yeah. chest is heaving. You're on the balcony like a Vita. <laughs> Breaths are I am currently, more and more labored. I am, I am labored in my breathing. I am nonetheless proceeding to co-host Rush Limbaugh's talk show. And <laughs> I, am un- I am kite. undeterred. <laughs> it's as I know, it's, I'm reassured because as I get older, I complain about the same things I think every New Yorker complains about, which is like traffic, people walking, taxes, and now like Robert Moses, like I'm 
obsessed <laughs> with like him putting the highways on near the water and like me and my mm. wife have been walking up to central park and like walking around and it's pretty nice like people are, are there and it seems like the covid is getting better when you're in the middle of central park and you see everyone throwing baseballs and barbecuing and then you get to the prettiest part of the island which is where the water is and it's just like kind of empty highways and yeah. empty office buildings and and hotels i mean neighborhoods in new york have always had a, a personality you know based on who lives there based on what its functionality is within the ecosystem of new york pablo is a pink elephant you know <laughs> in meatpacking district but then <laughs> midtown's you know full of cabs and office workers and you know there's sort of a tidal flow over the course of a day you know, the East Village, that's where people go to hang out and party at night, et cetera. And, and right now it feels like COVID has had that kind of effect and, and, or, even, or it's even more pronounced, you know, um, where I live in, in, in Brooklyn, like North Brooklyn, it's really quiet, like very quiet. You go over to Williamsburg, it's popping. It's outdoor dining on like every street, just everywhere. And it's a totally different vibe, even though it's only a five minute walk away. And I wonder if mm -hmm. that's also kind of true, you know, East Village versus West Village. I think that's kind of happening there as well. Like the West Village is empty. So I guess what I'm trying to get around to is I think people's experiences, because we've become so cloistered in our neighborhoods, are, are even more like affected by where you live geographically than normally. Yeah, I always think about the Premier League in soccer, no Sinbin. And how they have their own teams that are so close to each other. So as it's as if, if the Knicks were Midtown, and then right, Downtown right. had a team, and Brooklyn had the Nets, but the West Village had their own team. It's really weird. like that show Daredevil. We always joke about this. Like they've been trafficking people in Hell's Kitchen. I'm like, right over there, like ten blocks over there, they've been trafficking people, but not here. It's like, wow, I gotta watch this show, man. <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, I was. Oh, I mean, this is really neither here nor there, but I was um, in London, what feels like a million years ago, and I remember walking like past where Chelsea plays, mm. and then like winding up where Fulham plays, and I was like, yeah. wait a minute, yeah. how, what? How is this so close together? And yeah, I, 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 you know, on the point of neighborhoods, like where I am in particular, I, I don't know if there's a better like um, photo uh, encapsulation of like, just one of these fancy restaurants like Marea, for instance, on mm -hmm. Central Park West, like trying to make do with outdoor dining and trying to dress up a sidewalk next to like invariably a person who is like down on their luck and like lying on the ground. And it's just like, yeah, this is the, the whole like aesthetic of what Midtown <laughs> wants to be is truly impossible in any way, given what we're seeing, which is, you know, not unique, but particularly pronounced when it's trying to like cover it up with, let's throw a white tablecloth over yeah. this trash can. Yeah. So I guess where I was going with this is like, what's been your experience living there? Because from a personal standpoint, you know, Greenpoint is kind of like a small town and you know, some people, you go to the same places all the time. It's quiet. It's residential. People hang out by the water. What's it been like, you know, from March until now being in Midtown and of course, I would assume for a large part of that, if not now, you've always been working like out of your house. Yeah, I so I hesitate to tell you what I'm about to tell you because I actually thought mm -hmm. about like, I'm going to pitch a, you know, those New York Times letters of recommendation. I was like, I, I want to pitch one of these because people do need to know about it. But then my like devil on the other shoulder, that's the angel. The devil's like, no, keep this to yourself. You don't want anyone else to know that the East River Ferry is the greatest thing in New York City <laughs> oh, right now. Oh, huge. Wow. It's the fucking best. It is like $2. You are on a river. It is usually not packed at all. So any of your like COVID anxieties are pretty, are pretty mitigated by that fact, plus the outdoors aspect of it. So for me... I walk to the water, Ben. I don't even go, like, to go west in Midtown is, is a fool's errand for me. Like, I can't <laughs> walk through that shit. Like, I like, I'm a, I'm a guy who walks, and I'm a guy who likes to be outdoors. And 
I just get my vitamin D on the water. I just go, I go to the East River Ferry and just, I, ro- I rode the East River Ferry two weeks ago from 34th Street to Soundview in the Bronx, mm-hmm. just back and forth. I rode past Rikers Island. I just, it was, it was like a bizarre angle on New York for $2 that I had never seen before despite living in the city for my entire life. And so I'm just all, I'm putting all my eggs into that ferry um, as much as I can in terms of what am I doing with my free time? Well, I'm listening to podcasts on the East River Ferry and wandering around far-flung neighborhoods that I could not access otherwise. And this does tie into what Andrew was talking about a second ago with, you know, kind of our misuse of the waterways and, and Robert Moses, where we don't really get to live as if we're on an island, but the ferry does kind of reopen that possibility. Yeah. And, and I'm with you. I think the ferry is great. And when people are visiting, I always recommend, you know, take the one from 34th Street or take the one from Williamsburg or Greenpoint and go over to like, you know, beneath the bridges. And like, it's, it's really impressive. And uh, I always enjoyed that route when going to the Freeze Art Fair on, uh, I think, is that Roosevelt Island? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, you can take it. Through. I, I went to Roosevelt Island for the first time because yeah. of the ferry. And oh, taking, yeah. taking like one ferry to the other ferry just was a whole different experience on traveling around New York City. I'm with you, Pablo. Yeah, I mean, it is the only, again, I, I, ESPN would like us to not get political, but I feel like I could say this without literally any backlash, but I loathe with every ounce of my being Bill de Blasio. I don't think anyone is going to like make boy. a Breitbart post wow. about that. It's Ben's Quo is boy. Sorry. Quo is furious. <laughs> <laughs> my boy. <laughs> but, 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 to his credit, oh. the East River Ferry was under his administration. And I, I, I must give him credit for allowing me to profit off of that um, in the way that I selfishly can. Is there a stop at 14th Street? That's been a bit of a stumbling block No, it goes me. So it goes to Stuyvesant Cove, which is 23rd. Then it goes to Corlears Hook, which is like Lower East Side, um, closer down to like the way east part of, you know, walk, follow Canal all the way down, you know, right. past oh, the this projects This guy's like over a fucking there. salty sea dog over here. Yeah, this oh, sounds man, like I can give Moby you routes. Dick. Yeah. <laughs> it's out there this swabbing is... decks. Yeah. I heard there was <laughs> a book called names. Moby Dick. This sounds like it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but by the way, like the other thing that I love to do, and, and this is, again, another letter of a recommendation that I will never I write keel, because I love I'm too keel selfish. Hauling people. <laughs> I love throwing harpoons. Um, no, it's going whale watching. You can take a ferry to Rockaway. You can take it Wall Street to Rockaway. No. You hop on a boat. There are humpback whales in New York Harbor. There are hundreds of dolphins in New York Harbor. You could see the, the Empire State Building in the background. And in front of it is a breaching humpback whale. I've seen it with my own eyes. It is Truly mind blowing. This was not the case. Again, Quo, you're from Manhattan too. Ben, you've wait, Ben, where you're from Rochester, right? Originally? Yeah, but I've lived down here twenty some years and I've never seen a whale. Yeah, no, this was not a thing growing up. But what happened, again, to add a layer of very sincere research to this conversation, um, <laughs> there's there's a bunch of menhaden, these tiny fish that have just again, the the waterways have somehow cleaned up in the last several years amid all of this shit. And so all the fish came back and all these humpbacks are oh, in the water just live in the dream when they're not getting hit by ferry boats that I am on. But other than that, it's amazing. I like that I got into hiking. You got into ferries and whaling. And Quo got into spelunking. <laughs> in the toilet Quo, you need, with a sandwich. You, <laughs> you're going to need some kind of weird hobby. I mean, I'm up there traipsing around the woods, looking out for bears. Pablo's mm-hmm. harpooning whales. What are you going to add to this equation? Yeah, Quo? you need to bring like the other... A Captain Planet ingredient here, Quo. When we put our rings together and I'm water, you know, who are you going to be? You either have to get into air or fire, as far as I'm concerned. I, they call me the big fat bird. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of like Williamsburg, but different. Um, but, you know, Pablo, so there's this downtown scammer that Ben is lying when he says he hasn't been whale watching because we call him the white whale and sometimes <laughs> late at night he'll show up and i'll get texts from random people being like whale spotting and it's this local scammer ben i mean wh- what does he pitch you when you see him at lucien 
Wait, I need I need a visual. Can you guys paint the picture of okay, he is, the scammer? He is, he's a Mexican man. He is <laughs> definitely overweight. He's a big guy. Uh, let's let's say he's fifty years old. Maybe he's a little younger. Maybe a little older. I'm not sure. By the way, as you continue this description, just imagine like a 2K create a player mode. <laughs> yeah, yes, currently yes. adding and editing features based on the adjectives yeah. you're using. Take off the headband. <laughs> Put on a billowing white shirt. Unbutton several buttons. <laughs> yeah. One more, and the button slider right right above the navel. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I I remember having a conversation with this guy, and I was saying, and he's from Mexico City, and I enjoy that place so i was mentioning some places down there that i um, have eaten at and he yeah. was just like no 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 not no 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 you know i'm like all right fine whatever and he's like no you you just just go to la bernardine just go to la bernardine i'm like <laughs> well yeah sure i guess <laughs> i mean I, yeah that, that is a one of the greatest restaurants in the world i would agree with you he's like yeah you just go there for lunch you know <laughs> Take a date there, you know, go to lunch, go to walk around Central Park, go back to a hotel room. I'm like, okay, okay, all right, that's great. <laughs> and then the bill came and he disappeared. The white whale. And after wow. a conversation, which he had told people that he owns six properties around the world, told me that he eats lunch at Le Bernardine routinely. And then the guy vanished when the check came. And I was outside and I saw him like sneaking down the street. <laughs> <laughs> away from the restaurant and I came back in and I was like what's up with your guy and they're like what are you talking about he's out at the ATM and another one of my buddies said no I was at the ATM over his shoulder and, and um, it was like insufficient funds oh, wow. so this is the whale so when he arrives there's like a group chat that's like whale sighting we've spotted this guy he's here like we know that the guy who owns six properties eats Le Bernardine flees on $80 bar tabs is now in the mix. So he's our version of the land whale. No wow. opposable thumbs, man. He can't reach for his wallet and credit card. <laughs> He's got no thumbs, man. Be real about this, Ben. Probably got a blowhole. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's about the the wildlife we get down here. <laughs> <laughs> I will I will say Liberta Dean also like that's that's the best example of sad golden uh, golden, whatever I was saying, golden, uh, golden age, like fancy mm. restaurant. Now trying to make it work. Like, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not spending a million dollars to eat a Bernardine right now if I'm doing outdoor dining in that way. Sorry. I know. I know. Frenchette and um, Estella were doing an outdoor. I don't know if it was picnic tables or whatever it was at at Rock Center. Did you you went to it, Quo? I went to it. Oh, it look at this king. Yeah, wow. I walked. I walked up there. Because they announce it on Twitter, and that's the only news I get, Twitter. And so I, I put on my Hoka walking shoes, and I, I went up there, and it was modest. Everything makes me sad now, defund Wist. Um, but I feel like it was a shell of what I wanted it to be. I kind of wanted it to be like this weird cartoon, like Richard Scary scene, where all these great restaurants were serving up plates of amazing food. <laughs> And it was just a bunch of tourists and confused. Like, what can we eat? Where can we sit? And there's like a nice area where the rink uh, usually is with like built out tables, built out seating areas. And you can sit down with a menu and get some things. But it is, I mean, no one can do this, right? Because I actually ate at Frenchette like a month ago when they first started doing outdoor seating. And there's no music. Thankfully, I did not have to hear 90s rap when I eat my french fries. <laughs> but when it's not 90s rap, it's really nice to be in a restaurant. And, like, none of this is really clicking, right? I, I definitely feel an oscillating sense of, of sadness and enthusiasm for outdoor dining in general when you're walking around. And sometimes it looks pretty sad. You know, it's like a little shack by the side of the street and there's... Yeah buses and trucks stopping garbage bags around but other times it looks really nice people mm -hmm. you know there'll be a whole street and both sides will yes. be full yes. and it, it does feel like like we're doing the best we can and it looks pretty damn good mm -hmm. so i'm all over the place with it I, I think it's necessary but sometimes you're like hmm, man this is not ideal at all yeah, and I do. Yeah, and this is the this is my favorite recurring argument between you guys on this podcast that I now get to like be the third person in on. But like, yes. how much to indulge and how much to be a part of the city during this time? And obviously, we all want to support restaurants, but we also want to be 
concerned about our own self. And to be honest, like, and this is where I get to put myself on the graph of like uh, mm -hmm. inside person versus outside person. <laughs> and you guys are the two ends of the axis. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, I'm increasingly going outside, but yeah, I, I will say like, I am proud to say that I have been ordering so much delivery recently. Wow. And that's how I've been, that's how I've been um, supporting the economy. While ruining the environment. <laughs> <laughs> Just flushing styrofoam <laughs> containers down the toilet. They call them Pablo Bergs. Just, just, <laughs> he won't throw them out, so just hundreds and hundreds of Tupperware containers lining his apartment. Yeah. Uh, recycling is a scam, right? Like, we could, so we could talk about this. Well, I, I just, again, I also get my news on Twitter, which is <laughs> the, the RSS the reader way. that the, the devil way. invented. Uh, yeah. but, but that's, like, true? Like, recycling and sorting, like, doesn't, it was a scam the whole time? Is that the upshot of all of this? It's, it's on a spectrum because I think overall it's a good practice. But from what Twitter has taught me, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is overrun by unions and, like, people who have seized control over this sector. And a lot of the things, like, for example, plastic bags uh, are, are unrecyclable because they just get tangled up in machines. That's why you should go to cookies.com hoops.com and buy mm -hmm. one of our New Yorker bags it's, it's yeah. because you can reuse it's, it's them. That's true. It's true. You can put your, canvas. Yeah, you can <laughs> uh, shovel your gruel into them. But uh, yeah, so it's a whole complicated thing where there are all these codes with all these recyclable products that are not compatible with certain uh, like facilities and people who pick them up and have to sort them. And it maybe creates as much carbon as it would if you just let things alone and just like put them somewhere. There is a, a new, is it a bacteria? Is it an enzyme? Some sort of creation they're saying that oh. can actually break down plastic much I'm loving faster. this. This, yeah. is a, this is like a new development. Ooh. Scientists came up with some super plastic devouring Scientists, critter. I am the devouring critter over the toilet, so I think <laughs> I'm helping develop this. Release quo into the dump. <laughs> Stand back, friends. I will solve recycling. <laughs> I've, I've always had a natural suspicion to s recycling because it felt like I was doing someone else's work. I'm like, so just to be clear, I'm going to buy the yogurt. I'm going to eat the yogurt. I'm going to wash the yogurt out. Then I'm going to take the can and I'm going to put the can in a bag. Then I'm going to return the bag to you. Like, where's my cut? Like, what's the vig? Oh, are you this? upset that you're a middleman? Are you becoming the middleman? I, an unpaid middleman. <laughs> wow. What is just, this, this multi-leveling recycling yeah. scheme? <laughs> here's, here's, here's the plastic carton that I purchased. You can have it back now perfectly clean. That you pay for a recycling fee for as you uh, purchase. Scam. It, it, it kind of does reek of a scam. But, you know, I heard people clean their apartments before they get housekeepers over because there's a deep clean and there's a surface clean, right? So aren't you just doing the surface kind of – you're making this thing jump off. You're the facilitator. You're Ben Simmons of recycling. Yeah, my, my, my mother definitely does that. When, when they'll bring yeah. someone in to clean the house, she'll, like, go wild and, like, vacuum it first. That's smart, yep. right? Yeah. I think that's smart. I go a different method, but I feel <laughs> I do the opposite, but fine. I'll invite people over for a big dinner and then leave the dishes everywhere. <laughs> yes, do these dishes. Yes. Uh, the deep clean, though, I, I do love that phrase because I don't know what it means, but I've asked for it every time. Yeah. I, I'll clean the bathroom, and my wife will be like, no, really clean it. I'm like, what do you mean? I, I just did this. I'm eating a hoagie over the toilet. Everything is sanitary and great. And she's I like, I just Deep took a shower. It. Like, yeah. it's good in here. <laughs> she's like, it's this is kind of Trump related, right? Because I'm like, oh, but she's like, how could you have cleaned it? It only took you three minutes. And I'm like, oh, I just wipe stuff down, you know. And there's that the U.S. Office episode when Michael Scott like sees. I always think about this with Trump. When Michael Scott sees a person with disabilities and he's like, how long does it take you to brush your teeth? And they say like, oh, a few minutes. It's like, see, it only takes me like 15 seconds. And <laughs> that's how I feel about Trump, right? He's like, I am out of the hospital. I'm like, good for you, buddy. It took me two minutes to clean my bathroom too. It's because I'm incredibly young. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm incredibly good at deep cleaning. <laughs> Very young. <laughs> My man, DJ Cool over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when did Trump turn into like a, a 90s rap DJ? <laughs> he, that's his ad lib, man. You wouldn't understand. It was funny, that thing with um, Mike Pence 
and I forget the media outlet, but they went and inadvertently published a story saying that Deadline Hollywood again. Deadline that was because awesome. I am on Twitter all the time, <laughs> that saying awesome. that 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 Vice President Mike Pence had announced that he had COVID, and and people were scandalized by it. But I, it makes total sense to me, mm-hmm. because you write articles speculatively at times. Oh yeah, there was a I, I remember. At some point, and this is, I think, not too far out of school, but like I remember at some point this year, um, and I won't tell you who we wrote obits about, but like ESPN internally assigned all of these obituaries. And I was like, ooh, we're putting that guy on the list. Okay, interesting, interesting. The committee, <laughs> what do you know? What do you know the, about the, him? <laughs> the committee for pre-obituary uh, publishing has elected this person who I did not think would make the list, but they did. <laughs> I, yeah, but, New York Times famously does this. There, there have yes. been people who uh, have had obituaries that have been updated for 20 years. Mm-hmm. I accidentally killed Danny Ainge on this podcast when he had that <laughs> heart attack. Uh, <laughs> one of my buddies, Adam McEwen, who's a contemporary artist, does obituaries of people who are alive, like Pamela Anderson, you know, uh, Jeff Koons, or whatever. And it turns out he used to write obituaries for a paper in London. So he had done this for, uh, like, like as a side gig for years and everyone does this right like is twitter outrage just a conversation or is it actual outrage i think it's a lack of understanding of this Mm. tactic that has been used within media for echelons echelons Mm. for eons epochs (laughs) whatever what i'm looking for here that's been going on forever (laughs) yeah people write obituaries for older people who might die so you don't have to write 2,500 words and publish it a week later. Twitter has the leprechaun gifts ready to go and the Celtics haven't even lost the series yet, but they're there. <laughs> right? They're all in drafts, just waiting <laughs> to be released. I mean, I like that there's such a horrid, horrid sense of, of, of fluency on Twitter between the three of us that we can really talk about anything. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. Just... I've opted out of a lot of it. <laughs> You're such a liar. <laughs> <laughs> it's very funny. <laughs> but I have to update it. I've opted out of caring about it because, okay, like, okay. if Trump is like, <laughs> is he lying about being sick? I'm like, of course he is. <laughs> like, is there any jokes? If there's none, I move on. Sort of like a grazing whale sucking plankton into my gills. <laughs> I will say, like, whenever you, I mean, this is not news to you guys, but, like, even trying to rigorously analyze how Twitter is feeling about something is such a, um, it's such an empty, sad exercise because invariably you just remember, like, right, this is the platform where, like, a flattened, low-resolution JPEG that someone made in Microsoft Paint has as much currency as, like, a screenshot from the New York Times. Like, there is just a total flattening of credibility across how people get information at this point that we are obviously all very complicit in because we are also all there despite working or being familiar with media organizations at high levels. And it's just like, yeah, I probably probably should stop running in this hamster wheel, but I can't stop (laughs) consuming content. Yeah, there is that almost, I'm going to use the word phenomenon, even though it's not necessarily a phenomenon, it's, it's almost like an animal instinct or or muscle memory when you close down Twitter and then you open it back up again. Oh, it's, you know, my, 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 I I keep my, the, the, (laughs) my left hand, I'm currently gesturing it and like making the uh, command T pressing T again, (laughs) enter. Like, it's just a reflex. Like it's, it's, I will unconsciously discover that I have opened up Twitter just despite (laughs) having tried to close it mere seconds before. It's scary. Yeah, and I'll be like, all right, enough, and I'll close it, and then I'll instinctually open it back up, and I'm like, you really got me. <laughs> yeah, I'll take a break from my Twitter to go visit the interns at their cookies Twitter, mm-hmm. and then take a break from that by going back to my own Twitter. <laughs> it's pretty enough. amazing. Let's yeah. see what's going on over on my feed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> by the way, is there any hope for, like, is the idea of an RSS reader or an RSS feed um, were you guys RSS people, by the way? Am I speaking to? Um, I don't really. I was people not, but I, I always liked the idea. Well, it, 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 it's 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 Twitter, except without any of the ability to comment 
which is essentially not Twitter, of course. But yeah, like I, I just want I, I just I just realize that I'm just consuming news this way. And it's like the most it's like trying <laughs> it's like, I love eating fruit. What am I going to do? I'm going to get all of this yogurt with fruit at the bottom. Like, just get fruit. Like, why are you digging through all this yogurt? Mm-hmm. Just get the fruit. It is an oddly now natural way of consuming the news of the day because it's a total mix of whatever your feed almost, I mean, it, it's self-selecting, but almost arbitrarily in what your interests are. So it's like, here's the news from the political spectrum breaking news, big stories. Also, here's a bunch of people talking about how you're an idiot for thinking Al Horford's not the problem. <laughs> like, it, it's just this mass of, of information that isn't even in order or coherent. And you'll be following a, a, the story of the day, and all of a sudden they'll give you a tweet that's like 14 hours old, and I'm just irate. Yeah. Stop giving me day-old tweets. So, so <laughs> Only I've been, the new stuff. <laughs> I've been binging on... I tweeted this last night. I've been binging on buy, sell, trade, like, hype beast YouTubes. Whoa, wait, 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 wait. So these are, like, secondary market YouTube videos? Is that what you're describing? Yeah, and uh, some of these are huge that have millions of views. And it's basically just vintage guys, like, trading uh, a stack of shoes for another stack of shoes. And it's like, what you got? And they go through them, like, this is in good condition. I can use this. Oh, yeah, these are hot right now. I'll take this. I don't need this. And I've just been, like, consuming hours and hours of this. And the dexterity these kids have, and they're kids, like, under 30. I call them kids. The dexterity, the cultural dexterity these these people have is insane they're like oh this is the original pearl jam 10 merch it's not in demand but you don't see this often oh this is an akira japanese drop (laughs) oh this is the jackass merch you know oh yeah you know kanye is good at this not this and whatever their their flexibility is so insane but and i was impressed at first and then i quickly adjusted and i was like well this is just what what we do on twitter right like we can move between al horford being actually secretly a key component of what the Sixers have to do and Trump coughing on a radio show. Also, what is the, I guess, level of superficiality to that knowledge? Because it seems like they have this huge knowledge base, but do they listen to, say, Pearl Jam? Do they know, like, mm-hmm. do they know anything oh, besides... Are you questioning their day oneness? Well, what I'm... <laughs> no, I'm, I'm questioning the breadth of their knowledge. Mm. They can go on this wide swath of pop culture minutia and, you know nostalgia but are they actually just knowing it from the reference point of vintage merch this is a great point and this is kind of what i was trying to say but you did it better it's like twitter is twitter and when i'm on there i don't think i know more about politics or the stock market or sports i know more about twitter and then i kind of have to Mm. log off and like do I even watch the games, bro? That's what I ask myself. Well, apparently n- people are not <laughs> watching the games, bro. Like, or at the very least, not as many. And it, it, I, I, as, as part of the problem that you are describing myself, yeah, it's, again, we're, <laughs> the age of content has not been kind to um, the actual works, which I think we need to start calling something else, like music, games like it mm-hmm. we, we got to stop calling that content because content i feel like is now the the distilled um grazable thing but it has come to mean everything and it and it should not be we should we've got to yeah I, I sound so old my god <laughs> i sound so old well not to gas up our our guest here but i think what you do at espn and the daily and what mina had started before you took over was like I think an extraordinary move because it kind of existed outside of the way like I just had information laser beamed into my head and you guys tell stories and I kind of wanted to ask you about that and how how you separate like the I always use this off white from the white right and they're (laughs) distinctly different things but you're talking about what we talk about with a certain cadence and speed on Twitter but then you're like you're existing outside of that and like sculpting a different idea right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, first off, thank you. That's exactly um, what I'm doing. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I will say, like, I weirdly, not just because I just called myself old and shook my fist at the sky, uh, but I feel kind of like uh, morally safer more than I ever have before. Like one of these 60 mm-hmm. minutes, like news anchor. I, I, it's, it's just, I exist within this podcast world. Like it feels more like a news magazine than it does something that is 
um, humming along with the rhythms of Twitter. And so there are ways that I intentionally try to touch on things that matter to people on social media because believe me that's also me so i so i do try to do that but by and large we're trying to like you know make editorial decisions that feels a lot like maybe 60 minutes is like a very old bad uh not exciting reference but like maybe it's more like a college newspaper like we're just sort of in this different metabolism where we're trying to make decisions on like what is interesting today and does it have to correct does it have to connect directly to what people are like all talking about on Twitter oftentimes the answer is no and so that is this kind of unplugging that I have enjoyed I've really enjoyed being like a managing editor of a a sort of like publication so to speak that is on a different rhythm than even a daily sports talk tv show let alone Twitter. So yeah, I've, I've really, I, I have relished in that different kind of pace. That's what's interesting about the democratization, especially during COVID where everyone is just kind of recording from their house. And it's like the built-in advantages you have of a massive audience or a huge platform are still there. But, you know, the curtain is kind of pulled back where it's like you, just like everyone else sitting in your apartment, like, this is yes. this is what it is. And I think that's interesting when you talk about the role of more powerful institutions who have bigger budgets and like what can they do to separate themselves from the riffraff, from the noise, from anyone with a computer. And it's weird to me when I see large outlets kind of adopting the first person vernacular of like a blogger on their Twitter page like Yahoo. I'm like, this is weird to me. It's Yahoo, a multi-billion dollar company or whatever it's worth, trying to use like a slang filled voice as its public persona. That's just so strange to me. I, that's one of the things I cannot get over and it doesn't bother me. It's just weird. It's not even the same as like Hamburger Helper dropping a rap album with the Migos. Like, it's just so odd to see an outlet not speaking in, like, a typical outlet voice to me. I kind of don't get it. Well, I think it's a lot about everyone. I mean, everyone is trying to game, like, social media in ways that I think are a lot, like, ultimately that and it's, it's I'm parodying myself here. But, like, because um, I'm going to reference a meme to use as a metaphor for the destruction of like our brains via consumption of memes. But like, it's like that meme of a raccoon trying to like eat <laughs> yes. cotton candy by dipping yes. it in water. And oh my God, that's a heartbreaking one. I, I get you. But that's, that's time. us. Yeah. That's who yeah. we are. It's <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I've created content. I'm going to put it into the water of my timeline. And within seconds, it's evaporated and I'm on to the next thing. And we try and like game stuff to get engagement. And that is Yahoo getting young, hip, cool people to like tweet for them. But in fact, like what a lot of us and these companies do best is not meant for the social graph, so to speak. Like, and that shouldn't be the, again, I sound so old, but that shouldn't be the North star for what we do. But because we're all there, it does feel like that all the time. And so we're just trying to shovel cotton candy in our mouths that never actually (laughs) reach our stomach. Yeah, and to be clear, this is not me hating on the guys who are getting a check from Yahoo to do it. No, of course not. Of course <laughs> like, not. Like, all due respect, do your thing. It, it's just, I think it's the, just the choices that different outlets make to say, all right, we're going to abandon sort of our newsy voice, our authoritative voice, and we're just going to speak in emojis. <laughs> like, <laughs> that, that's what our brand is now. And it's a little discordant. I mean, you even see it, you know, a little bit with Sports Center. You see it with. Oh, no. Um, it's, I mean, I saw, I was watching, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about another sports media company now, so as to not throw my own under the bus, but like, I was watching <laughs> this Thursday night football game last night, and after the oh, game, yeah. they were throwing a tweet on the screen, and it was like Allen Robinson, the receiver for the Bears, like, used a no cap, like, no emoji of a cap. <laughs> yeah. And like, Michael Irvin was trying to, like, <laughs> verbalize that, and it was like watching a guy, you know, try to put together a computer who has never seen a computer before. It's just like, why are we? doing this why are we trying to have people not fluent in these languages pretend like they are yeah and this is like my hang up and i think media companies have to shoot their shot and because everyone's shooting their shot it is the the premise the foundational uh, uh idea of technology and the way we use it and i think 
it all comes down to personnel, and me and Ben always talk about this. Like you can have a perfect plan going into constructing a team, but it's based on your personnel and who you have on the court. And you know, Michael Irvin is the wrong one to do that, but there is a right one to do it. And I think what we don't talk about enough, we always say, you know, like well, I always say, Twitter and YouTube and and no cap, you know, emojis, but we're not talking about the way things are changing enough. Like I'm frustrated with news in that they don't talk about where the elephant is the room and we are in it, you know? And Mm. I think we have to reverse those things and then look at media through a different lens. And I think it might start making more sense to us. The ceiling is the roof. The elephant (laughs) is the room. Let's, Jason Tatum is the a Martel well Webster of Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, thank thank God for certain voices in media because they're so good at it. Like my favorite thing is like This American Life, but it's not the idea. It's Ira Glass, it's Zoe Chase, it's David Sedaris, right? Mm. The, they can go anywhere. It's a player versus management idea, I guess. You mean as in like plug and play talent? <laughs> well, I like your Paul George arriving can, to can play David, for the Knicks. Can David Sedaris stretch the floor? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if David Sedaris pops up on Fox, like I'm psyched on watching that, right? <laughs> well, this by the is, way, this does lead to where you guys are, which is you have a Patreon. Like we're all, I mean, look, uh, yeah. the 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 ultimate distillation of all of this is like, no, follow people you like and pay for it and support them. And that feels like the most future-proofed model um, in ways Maybe. that are probably terrifying to every media company, certainly, who rely on live rights deals and cable TV ratings and Nielsen ratings, and it's all being disruptive, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where we're all headed. Yeah, I mean, I've always thought if, if you gave me four writers and who are the right people, you could make the kind of noise on Twitter and social media that a large company does. Mm-hmm. If you have the right people, it's that's yeah. what you're saying. It's personnel. If you have a huge company, I don't know, Refinery Twenty Nine with a, a staff, and you're doing stuff, you should see how little interaction they get sometimes. They'll put Dude, up, they have a newsletter. It's really weird. It's really but weird. They'll have a million. They have a million some followers, and they'll put up a tweet, and they'll get four likes. Really odd. And yeah, it, it's really bizarre. Yeah. So it is this idea that you can scale down these massive companies that have all this overhead and office space and be like, yeah, we just have four people working remotely from all over the country and we're just going to write about what's happening on Twitter and then feed the beast. And you're like, that's a, that's a real rival. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, you can only have so many bald eagles on your team, but if the Lakers have the two guys, like, and they can do as much damage as like the Clippers can, right? <laughs> Is this a Caruso thing? Do you have Caruso? <laughs> Am I off? No. Yeah. I got. You don't joke about Caruso, man. The Bald Eagle is going to win a championship. So let's respect. Put some respect on the Bald Eagle's name. Well, the one question <laughs> I have for Pablo is Andrew came up with a theory a few weeks back. No, no. That Ooh. if you are. If you've spent a certain amount of time in the Boston area, mm. you are by default BMM. Boston Media Mafia. Mm. Formative years. Then he realized that included himself. Mm -hmm. Now, Pablo, (laughs) do you feel like you are, have you escaped the clutches of the BMM? I have recently (laughs) felt its pull. (laughs) Oh, what? I was doing Around the Horn earlier this week on Monday, and I hadn't seen Bob Ryan in seven months because of everything obviously and we got into a conversation that was genuinely nostalgic about the fours that sports bar in boston that is shut down due to the pandemic but is the place where like every boston athlete and bmm literal (laughs) bmm member would go like bob ryan was telling me how like he wanted them in the i actually don't even remember if they literally did this or they were just talking about it but did they put his typewriter like in the rafters of the bar (laughs) like jackie mcmullen would tell stories about how you know she had she felt like a celebrity there as much as you know old tommy heinsohn would like so that (laughs) that that world a lot of rings yeah so many rings um that so many cigars chomped. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, 
I, I have felt the lure of it, and I, I did enjoy <laughs> how it felt for a time. Do you think Quo's theory holds water? That, like, being in that area, like, the little green hand just gets you by the ankle. <laughs> We're all controlled by little green hands somehow. <laughs> it is. I mean, is this when I reveal that I am actually the uh, person running the NBA Central Twitter account? <laughs> <laughs> it is wow. I. Yes. Yeah. It is I all along. <laughs> it is I who've been pushing Ben Simmons for Evan Fournier trades for the last <laughs> three years. Yeah. I am yeah. the hand on the ankle of Ben Simmons. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Is Jason Tatum this wonderful waterway <laughs> that gets you from A to B and takes you to the wonderful, magical nature of whale watching? Uh, I mean, I, 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 Providence was close, but it had a more of a pull towards New York than Boston, I feel like. Right. Well, you weren't really in, like, the leprechaun's pot of gold as I, Pablo was. Yeah, I wasn't sliding towards that on that, that rainbow slide. <laughs> <laughs> towards that pot of gold. But I went up to Boston to see shows and stuff, and that was a very intense city, man. Um, I just remember when bars got out, just people urinating everywhere. <laughs> it was a fountain of urination. And uh, some good shows there, man. The Middle East was an awesome club. Yeah, 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 yeah. So do you think, as someone who likes the Sixers, are, and someone who has been a process enthusiast, have you been stymied by the BMM? Like, are you getting, I don't know, shamrocks in the mail? Wow. Shillelaghs waved at you. Are there shenanigans, shamrock shenanigans <laughs> happening? Did I have a uh, decapitated horse show up in my bed, <laughs> spray painted in green? It has felt that way sometimes. It has been, I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to, to, to people who are obviously like-minded here, or at least I don't know where Quo is really, truly, actually. No, no Neither do I. I don't know. I don't need. Um, <laughs> but but I, I, it, it's a lonely, it's a lonely, it's a lonely road. <laughs> to quote another band with green in its name, a yeah. lonely road where I have never. No, I'm just now bu butchering Green Day. It's <laughs> shout out to a great band, <laughs> a great American band. <laughs> um, but but yeah, I I, I just. Why isn't there a Philadelphia sports media? Yes, mafia? Pablo. Thank you. Thank you. Because there <laughs> fucking is. Answer the question, Ben. I, I, is there? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Someone's on the ropes. <laughs> I, I don't know. The I mean, all, all, I theory, all my theories are about the BMM. I don't know about the, <laughs> the, the PMM. But uh, I, do th I, I do think, I mean, and this is, you know, this is this is uh, dangerous for me to say, but like, ooh, ooh. if you go look at the roster of ESPN over the years, it's yep. unquestionably and unsurprisingly weighted with Boston Globe and Boston Herald and so oh, we know. alumni. I mean, that's true. That's objectively true. Mm -hmm. and, so, it, and it makes sense. It's in the Northeast. It's it was founded by guys who were in the Boston sports world. Yeah, I mean, in our kindest selves, we would say. You know, they they took the crown, right? They, it was there for any city to go for it. Unfortunately, New York is a wash of black nail polish, <laughs> and we have had nothing to talk about. And Boston has had something to talk about. I blame Tom Brady, no Simbin. And that has created a culture there that just, like, galvanizes people. Like, give me that. We're, we're sports media over here. So there is no Philadelphia sports media mafia that I know of. Maybe it's a hidden hand versus a red white and blue hand <laughs> but pablo you you are at one of the few people on a on a national sports level that has been pro sixers pro yes. sam hinky yes anti colangelo and I, have you noticed any sort of change over the last year or so in terms of people's criticism towards colangelo towards the front office as it exists towards elton brand it feels like the conversation has changed a bit I think it has changed, but I will also say that the angriest I probably have been as this Sixer fan slash uh, apologist slash propagandist slash only <laughs> honest person in sports media, um, it, has, yep. it, has, it, has, it has been very difficult to deal with the Sixers postseason elimination this year in a way that did not infuriate me. 
Like, I think that was because it just became a referendum, obviously. Right. It became a referendum on Ben Simmons, even though Ben Simmons literally was hurt and did not play. It became a referendum on Sam Hinkie, even though he had been general manager for 2.5 seasons, <laughs> yeah. like a presidential administration ago. It was just I, I it felt like it often does in consumption of news, like no one else had done the fucking homework. And I'm like, why do I have to teach this to people in 2020? And I just got legitimately angry. So I think there is a, 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 an understanding that over time, like, yeah, what the Sixers are doing right now with their administration currently is, is bad and that's not good and no one should be proud of it. But I think we're still seeing the thawing of like just these old frozen uh, notions of what actually happened. Which yeah, I, I asked you so that and then I thought about it. And I was like, <laughs> oh, right. We did do like yet another relitigation of the process. I was so mad. I was so mad. <laughs> I, I, I mean, again, like I, so many, so many tweet storms in my drafts that I was like, no, this is too earnest. This is yeah. too sincere. I can't, I can't do this right now. It's too real. Simmons goes to the finals, man. You can't tell me otherwise. They are my champions. Sixers back-to-back titles. Who, who knew they could do it? <laughs> yeah, you I showed me that. your back-to-back titles. <laughs> I, picked, I picked them to win the NBA title. I did that. And obviously it did not go well. But nonetheless, I, I – yeah, I mean, look, I, I don't need to tell you, Ben, how much I love other Ben. But I, 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 he's just this – I feel like I'm holding a, a, a stock that is – so undervalued yep, and yep. I don't even know if I want other people to buy it. You know, I'm, right. I don't know. I'm like, maybe fuck you guys. Actually, I'm going <laughs> to ride this out. <clears throat> in I, New York I, City I definitely feel that way it. for sure. <laughs> you know, like how many times do I have to tell you that this guy isn't the problem? It's like only out of the preservation of the Sixers where I'm like, let me just try to get a voice in here saying, you yes. don't need to split these guys up. And that's the worst possible thing that you could do. So like I'm trying to get that out there to counteract just levels upon levels and layers upon layers of misinformation. And <clears throat> excuse me, I'm choking up. This is such a... Ben, Ben, it's okay, man. <sighs> this is so important to me. Re- refund whist, go off. But no, my like entire Ben Simmons advocacy is based on him being unnecessarily hated upon by yes. people who generally don't know what they're talking about. That's it. I, it's, I like I like so Embiid. I, I don't like Simmons more than Embiid, but Simmons just gets trashed all the time in a way that Embiid only sort of gets trashed. I mean, I'll yeah. defend both of both of them, but it's like my Simmons position here is is simply in response to like very unwarranted, unnecessary, and honestly just stupid and cruel criticism. Yeah, it's in response to fraudulence. Like, I, I, no one wants to be the "Did you even watch the game?" guy guy. <laughs> But it feels like people didn't watch the game, guy. Like, watch him. Watch him play basketball. He's unreal. And, yeah, you, again, like, this can co- become a conversation about Twitter very quickly again. But, like, yeah, you see the memes, and you don't actually watch him play basketball. You, don't cons- you consume the content, but you don't consume his work. <laughs> you know, that's true. But I also have, have been thinking about this, right, where – you have a lot of people who say, does you even watch the games? And we've, uh, we've kind of given the mantle of expertise to someone who literally sits in front of their TV. And, of course, watching the games is, is valuable as an exercise. You saw what happened. You saw the guys miss shots. But fans have always watched the games and have always had terrible opinions. Like, there True. is no but necessarily, like, intact dovetailing between I watch the games and therefore I know what I'm talking about. We know that hasn't been the case forever. People will watch every Yankee game, every Knicks game, every Giants game, and then come to you and give you an insane take. Well, this is an exercise in arguing, not actually uh, Ben Simmons, right? Because this is just an argumentative tactic. It's like, you weren't there. You don't know. I, you know, like, well, I think so. You know, it's just a kind of way to propel uh, a conversation without giving up any ground I don't think it when people say do you even watch Ben Simmons play it's not about a thing it's about an idea 
basically it's code for I think I know more than you, right? Like so this is where I kind of do my classic opting out, the slippery slope of opting out. I'm like, oh, we're not talking anymore. We're just arguing. Well, I just mean at this point where every <laughs> game is available online, everyone can watch whatever they want. Dude, Jordan like, fans don't watch the 90s games, man, because like, that's some YMCA shit. No, I mean, back in the day, we didn't watch the games. And, yeah, it was and, hard to watch. It was that's hard true. to watch yeah, games. You didn't, you didn't watch them. Yeah. You know, if you were growing up and you had MSG, you had whatever it was, Yes or whatever the channel was that had the Nets back then. The Knicks were on WWOR, w- right? Yeah, and then you have WGN, and you watch yeah. all the Chicago games. Part of Jordan's mythology is just that everyone had WGN. If you had cable, you right. saw every single Bulls game. It was always on. We watched those games. We never watched Sonics. <laughs> like we didn't. I wish we didn't yeah. see Gary Payton play regular season games. And no, Simbin, this is what Ted Turner did with the Braves, right? He bought the Braves and then created a network where they played the Braves nationally, and it did and did not work. But like, uh, I agree, and I think, I think we're seeing like. Are, this is a question for both you guys. Are we seeing a shift between? the people aging out, the, the grill masters aging out of Jordanism into accepting LeBron as the best player of all time. Because after a while, this this argument gets, there's a fatigue factor, right? And people un, unfortunately just get older and lose interest. But I feel like the did you watch the games bro nation is kind of wilting. Mm. I would like to see polling data on that. I'd like yeah, to see yeah. Rasmussen tackle this question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, some real polls, you know. Um, yeah, yeah I, because I, I, I do think that fundamentally that conversation has always been about my dad can beat up your dad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's entirely about like my childhood was was great. How dare you tell me it wasn't? Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that that some, someone else's childhood was even like more full of Power Ranger toys and whatever the fuck <laughs> else kids these days enjoyed doing. Um, but I would like. <laughs> I, I would say that what Michael Jordan did with The Last Dance was a huge, savvy political maneuver that LeBron James will have trouble countering hmm. until his retirement. I think that for, all what, for everything LeBron does, both as a basketball player and also guy, you know, recruiting 10,000 poll volunteers and starting a school, et cetera, et cetera. That notion of invincibility that can only really be conveyed in cinema in that way. I, I, I just think that was a response to LeBron and also something that LeBron is undoubtedly plotting, but can't quite execute until, yeah, the time is right. I think that's a good point. I also don't believe there are a large community of Ken Bones here. People who are <laughs> on love, the fence. I love like, Ken Bone. Yeah. Well, let's see. Finals, game four. If LeBron closes it out tonight, greatest of all time. But if it goes to six games, sorry, it's MJ. <laughs> yeah. I, I just don't think there are undecided voters. Yeah. And you're talking about the, the grill masters who are like, Jordan's the GOAT. I they will say that forever. They will say that until they were lowered into the grave. They might just be less active in the conversations that we're seeing on a daily basis mm-hmm. because they're aging out because That's, these yeah. are older people. That's what I mean. yeah. But I don't, I don't think they're changing. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I think you're right. When, I mean, Jordan does have some built-in advantages, though. The fact that he has this documentary, the fact that he has sneakers. That's it. It's that Nike. kids wear. That's a, that makes a big difference yeah. because there are some guys – who are phenomenal players that we never talk about. We just never talk about them. And that's going to happen to some players. That might have happened to Kevin Durant. You know, Second in, best player of all time. You know, I mean, KD is an all-time great. In 20 years, people might not talk about Kevin Durant. Yeah. It's possible. Mm. And, and I don't mean that he'll be utterly forgotten, but he just won't be in those conversations. Perhaps. Maybe he will. I don't know. But you can go back and look who, like Moses Malone is a great example. And I think we talked about him a few weeks ago. Moses Malone won back-to-back MVPs. The Sixers went to, I think, three finals. They won one of them. They beat the Lakers. The P- Whoever the talks PM, about man. Moses Malone? This right. is the, this who is who the mentions PMM Moses at Malone? Work. No one. <laughs> That's the PM. PMM did not work very hard on getting <laughs> Moses Malone in yeah. the media cycle. But even, you know, to, 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 I was going to say Dr. J. I yeah. think Dr. J, I mean, you could throw... I mean, Barkley is in the news for different reasons, of course, but I think Dr. J might be better than Larry Bird. 
Oh, he is better than Lambert. I'm just saying. For sure. There's a pretty good argument there, but totally, totally different kind of status in terms of, you know, the historical, like, uh, hierarchy of, of all-time greats. Right. And this is, like, not to get... Not to get too earnest, but this is like the power of artwork, right? Like the Last Dance exists because Jordan has the can capture your imagination that way and can hold your attention for ten hours. He is a he's a wonderful player, maybe top six or top seven of all time. <laughs> Nothing to scoff at, but like he has been elevated into an idea, and there's an interesting story there i don't think you can make a two-hour documentary about moses malone right it's just like a different personnel and i think lebron james has the capabilities to do that shout out to space jam too whenever that comes out but it, it takes the certain stars to align for someone to create a story like michael jordan is the best player of all time you're like not so fast it's like well i'm wearing his shoes aren't i i'm like you got me there you know well so i have a question for pablo on this topic and this is not intended on you uh, even criticizing anyone you work with at all. That's off the table. That's not what we're talking about here. Man, what I'm Ooh. talking about here is the idea of, of, of nuance in sort of the sports media world. Why does nuance and I guess, you know, Ben Simmons was a good example. As you said, we know the numbers. We've seen what he does. Why is the perception say that Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid can't coexist why does that continue just to resonate and get said over and over and over, despite it being untrue? Like, why is it hard to get subtlety and, and nuance into that sports sort of media yeah. noise factory? Yeah, and I, I will borrow what Quo just said. I think it's a testament to the power of art. And by that, I mean, when you watch Stephen A. Smith go to work, you mm -hmm. are not the watching... King the foremost analyst of a sports stock market, you are watching a man on stage commanding an audience as well as anyone ever has. I mean, it's, it's more fun to say that. I mean, that's ultimately what it is. And, and this is probably um, both an indictment of my industry and also perhaps incredibly obvious. But yeah, what's the more fun take to have? You know, like when Stephen A works and working when we did high noon at the seaport we had desks that were in like the bullpen it was like an open concept office and the radio studio where Stephen a would work was like feet away and he would do a radio show at 1 p.m every day we would tape like after 2 p.m and so conceivably we're getting ready to do our show but invariably we would just hear Stephen A yelling through the noise proofed <laughs> walls and we would all stop. We would listen. And mm -hmm. that's us. Like mm -hmm. we, wow. we, we're the show that's trying to do like smarter analysis that's nuanced and has argumentation around, you know, actual substance and analysis. But at the end of the day, we want to hear <laughs> a guy fucking talk about how someone needs to stay off the weed, like a mixture <laughs> of Mozart and Steve Harvey. Like, I want that character. And, and it's way more fun to have the take of Ben Simmons can't shoot and Joel Embiid is a diva and these guys hate each other and they can never fit. And they need that drama because it is a far more fun product in that way. And I know I sound also like um, probably a lot of, of, of uh, message boards that <laughs> are also criticizing, like, political news media. Like, people are probably... Your listeners who are radicalized, obviously, are probably <laughs> thinking to themselves, yeah, that's exactly what I want to say about CNN. And I think in sports media, I think the difference would be it's less harmful and the theater of it is something that's more complicit and the health of the country isn't on the line. But I think ultimately that's what it is. And I, it's funny because there is a total distinction between sports and, in my mind, real life. For sure. Like, they're all part of real life, but there are definitely gradients of importance here. You know, what we're learning about, say, the separation of children at the border, that's on a different level of, of meaningfulness in our society. So, like, people getting angry about sports is, is, is funny. Right. And, and you're right. Sports is entertainment. So, like, 
there are certain times I think where people will get annoyed, like at me, because I don't take basketball seriously enough. I'm like, I do, but that's because I like it. Like my version of taking basketball seriously is having fun with basketball. And I feel like that's the same thing where I look like those people towards Stephen A. Smith. I'm like, why can't you get this right, Stephen? And I'm like, you are the greatest entertainer under the sun. At the same time. <laughs> yeah, I, but, yeah. yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say like, but I also think part of the fun of sports and, and obviously look, in what I do in my job every day, like we do also do like larger sports and society stories. But what we're really talking about is like that stock market of who's better and who's worse. And like what's extra fun about sports is that you can have this level of irony there's this Kaufman-esque, like, is anyone really, are we in on this? Are we not? Is this real? Is this fake? That sort of stagecraft. But then, underneath all of that, is a population of rich and famous people who legitimately see their own pride and humiliation on the line. Like, the idea that mm. athletes watch all, I mean, something that I, that I have never been able to shake since I started working for ESPN is how many athletes, unsurprisingly, watch ESPN all the time like and and they care about it and so the stock market to them is real in ways that are like more meaningful personally and also financially like they see this as their livelihoods like they worry about their contracts being affected by all this so there's a level of reality underneath the circus mm -hmm. and that sort of tension is what kind of what makes it delicious when people like go you know fall apart on Twitter or after a game like that is both real and whimsical. Yeah, and I feel this so deeply in my own field in like contemporary art making because there's the artists who make things, but then there's a whole industry that surrounds it, that buys and trades uh, the thing, who talks about it, who criticize it, to, and they frame it. And I think like by and large, artists are a little terrified of this mechanism that affects their practice and how they're perceived and you know we all know that how good or bad a player or artist is it's not necessarily the story that is told and Ben while, while I agree with you totally I, I almost by accident feel myself acting the opposite way I think sports and when you see people like Mina and Pablo and Lebetard talk about sports it it is a kind of foundational way of thinking that applies to everything else in life. And I always joke with my friends being like, you guys are the best takers about things that aren't sports, but it's all code. And if you immediate, mm. if you can listen closely enough, something will happen in our current event, something disastrous. And you guys will talk about football, but you're really kind of hinting at something else. <laughs> and I think that's a dexterity that certain people have, right? Yeah. Oh, I, 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 think, I, oh, I was just going to say, I think you're right that you see people's state of minds when it comes to their outlook on politics often seem to mirror what they think about mm -hmm. other parts of life and what their thought processes are and whether they are subversive or curious or just kind of regurgitate conventional ideas. I think there is absolutely a connection between your view on the sports world and your perspective on like you know, society at large. Yeah, and I would just add that like, I don't want that absurd theatricality to really change mm -hmm. because I mean, most selfishly because of what, a, because uh, what Quo said there is both appreciated and and kind of the scam that I'm running, yeah. which is to say <laughs> yes. that like, and I told this to Levitard on the radio once, and he was sort of shamed by it, but then I think over time has come to appreciate that that's exactly what's happening. It's not just that you're the critic, you're the critic of the critic of the critic. It's like a yep. fourth yep. level criticism where we're talking about how people talk about something. And if those people stop talking in that way, we would not be able to talk in the way that we do. So for instance, there was a story many moons ago, it was like a, a, a mom in Charlotte wrote a letter to the Charlotte Observer that was the classic, how dare Cam Newton be a bad example, bad role model for my child by celebrating and being flashy and being mm -hmm. me first. And the first level take is to say, what a, f what a, what a terrible, illogical, only vaguely racist sort of <laughs> thing to say. But the next second level thing is like, wait a minute. Okay, 
what if that mom doesn't exist anymore? And like, what if we're now flipping it to the point where we can no longer comment on society through these particular examples that pop up in sports? Because actually, people have gained a certain logic and wisdom that we fundamentally do agree with. Like, these examples allow us to comment on far more. And if those examples go away, then it's, it's a far less fun business as a critic to be in, in the way that we try to do it. It's a so, different ecosystem. So what I'm saying is, I hope racism never goes away. <laughs> oh, it, it so never will. Mean. And yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad for it too, right? Because it makes us actually talk about this stuff. I mean, right. You, you can't not be racist if there aren't racists around. People you, are going to take that. You, they're going to. That, see, I was, I was very cocksure about headlines of what I'm not going to be making in this podcast. And I feel like I hope racism never goes away is probably a thing I probably shouldn't have said. <laughs> well, I, I kind of wanted to ask you that as the first Asian American ho- co- co-guest on this podcast, because I'm usually outnumbered. How has being how has looking the way you looked been during COVID in New York City for you? Yeah, it's been, I mean, early on, it was scary. Um, mm. It was scary. I mean, I, my, I, my, you know, not to get too, too serious, but like my brother would tell me about like, this is when people were, telling, take, were taking the subway at first, and he would tell me about like, you know, this woman who was, you know, saying shit to him and accusing mm. him of like, you know, spreading this disease. It's just like the standard, like you're Asian, you're, you're the problem kind of stuff. And like that hit home. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it made you feel less safe about walking around and stuff. And certainly there were articles beyond the anecdotes that would sort of back that up. Um, but I also think that, you know, um, for me, there is an opportunity always when that happens to educate. So I, I talked on Dan's show about this, um, and it was something that I was really grateful for. Like, I, I, any time I can wedge in to the news cycle what it feels like to be an Asian person. Like, I I just don't know if people appreciate how rare that opportunity is. Mm -hmm. So again, it was weirdly like, it sucks that this is happening, but now I get to at the very least tell people about why it matters and what that's like and how that experience might be different. Um, So yeah, I, I, you know, I I would say that overall, um, I'm, I'm generally worried as, as obviously politics brings us in that direction of like, you know, China virus, et cetera. Um, Mm -hmm. But I I am always grateful when people are like, well, wait a minute, we have one of these people. Let's try to hear from them. (laughs) I mean, even yesterday, we have the president of the United States saying China virus, we're going to make China pay. This is China's Mm -hmm. fault. I mean, yesterday, yesterday, we're eight months in. Well, that's still (sighs) happening. And, and I mean, part of the other bit of like fun education is like, hey, let's talk about how I'm from the Philippines. And like, mm-hmm, there are mm-hmm. many different countries inside of hashtag whoa, Asia. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Hold up a second. <laughs> Wait a minute. No, yeah. but I mean, it, it, so, you know, I was reflecting on this actually quote to your point in your question. Like I, as a joke, that's again, like a tongue in cheek commentary around the rarity of Asians in sports. I claim as my own every single, even partly Asian athlete. And I was thinking mm, like, well, yep. wait a minute, I'm kind of the problem because I'm flattening out the Asian identity into just this one <laughs> single thing. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm getting to draw attention to the existence of these people that people don't even recognize as Asian in the first place. And then I was like, well, I think it's a net positive because at the very <laughs> least, I'm like, you know, increasing conversation around what it is like to be Asian. But the next level of the conversation is to point out that like when I claim Naomi Osaka, who is half Asian, half Japanese, and I genuinely am so excited in the way that, you know, God, I mean, Asian, look, there's there's so many rabbit holes I could fall down right now in terms (laughs) of representation, right? In terms of like, do we want Asian superheroes? Is that empty and pointless or is that actually very important like and what does I, this mean for jordan clarkson <laughs> well jordan clarkson who i i am embarrassed to not own and claim nearly as much despite being literally filipino i mean but that's the particular uh problem of jordan clarkson who i just truly dislike as a player um the bucket. 
Oh, God, who believes, by the way, that human <laughs> beings, giant human beings, used to walk dinosaurs. Um, that was Amazing. his last theory. What which a I, God. Yeah. My favorite part of his existence. Um, but my point <laughs> being, like, when I claim <laughs> Naomi Osaka, right, I, I, like, at some point I do want to point out to people, and by the way, uh, Japan and the Philippines, very not great historical relationship, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Japan invading the Philippines, Bataan death march, just like actual hatred and war. Like, at some point, I do want to get to that level of nuance, but unfortunately, we're not yeah. at that part of the timeline yet. But at some point, you will hear me mention yeah? the Bataan death march. Uh, and, and sort of like, anyway, I, but it's, it's, yeah, there's a weird mix of like responsibility and also complicity that I feel when I'm like cheerleading for Asia uh, on that level. I 1000% feel you because there's a, you know, baby steps. First, we just have to do one thing before we can do another. But, you know, when you know, Sinbin, when Hideki Matsui uh, was a big player for the Yankees, yeah. everyone would be like, aren't you psyched about him? I'm like, I'm Taiwanese. So this is really complicated. Yes, because <laughs> I love the Yankees and I love Asian people. Right, and right, when right. Jeremy Lin happened, or Yao Ming is a better example. I was a huge Yao Ming fan, but I'm Taiwanese, and there's a lot of conflict between China and Taiwan. And when it goes even as far as when Jeremy Lin and Lin Sanity was happening, I was like, holy shit, he's Taiwanese. This is insane. And then I find out he's very religious. He's like, oh, he's that part of Taiwanese, yep. which I'm not really associated with. So I feel alienated from him on that level. It's It's really complicated, and I always say on this pod, like, Every experience of every race is different, and it's hard to group racism into one thing. And the black experience, the Mexican experience, the Asian experience is all different and all nuanced. And then you get into the minutia of it, and I'm like, this is even hard for me as a participant to to differentiate, you know? I mean, even for myself, you know, as a big Gordon Hayward fan. <laughs> <laughs> Education reform guy over here, right? <laughs> Big gamer energy over here. You know, as, as, as gamers, uh, <laughs> the racism that we face. <laughs> but I, I do, I, I, you know, to go back to like the representation thing very briefly, um, you know, like I, I would say that a defining part of the Asian experience has been the, and this is what frustrates me so much about um, so much of American culture. It's like, the Asian childhood experience was trying and succeeding in mm -hmm. identifying with celebrities and people that have literally nothing to do with you. Yeah, totally. And so the idea that like, well, now I want people who look like me. The other part of me is like, I think the great American lesson is that you don't need to look like someone to identify with them. And I'm kind of like conflicted on that level because I, we were all trained in that way from actors to comic books to succeed and it can be done. And, and yet I also do like, will cop to the Jeremy Lin, you know, again, as, as you are the foremost artist in the world of Jeremy Lin uh, <laughs> <Gotta> <laughs> tributes keep, and, and gotta keep his name alive, man. I mean, believe me, I am, I am, I'm on that. I'm on the bandwagon forever. Um, but, you, but you have written the obituary. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. It has crossed my mind. Like I need to get on that before anyone else does. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, but there is that wiring inside of you when you do see someone who reminds you of yourself that is different. And that's a special thing that I also don't want to discount. I mean, yeah, seeing people who look like you and Mina on my TV talking about sports at the highest fucking level is, like, very meaningful to me. And it's hard to describe to... I've been trying to describe this to Ben for years almost, but I can't really get through what it meant to see Jeremy Lin play for the Knicks. It it still blows my mind. Yeah, I could talk about. I mean, look, that's the whole. We we that'll be another podcast we yes. do. But I could talk about that for for literally the rest of time. Yeah, I I agree. There is no end to me talking about this, and there's no amount of tears you know it's it's insane <laughs> just just i just just a, a a quick sample the the proustian madeline that i occasionally delight in um is is the image of a non-asian kid wearing a jeremy lynn oh, jersey yeah, yeah. on a playground in new york it, 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 i remember i i vividly every sense it rushes back when i remember yeah. that and i'm like fuck that is 
you know, like we're not in a post-racial society by any stretch, but that was a dose of optimism that I still sort of cling to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to ask you like a question during that era. It's like, I, for, you know, there's always a, to your point, a, a mild level of fear that I have walking any street in America. You know, it's, it's not deafening, but it's there. During Lynn Sanity, I felt like I had become seen like usually the Asian man is like to me unseen you know I can operate mm -hmm. in a room and people probably will pay attention to me last especially I'm, I'm short you know so it, it kind of like I, I'm in disguise always uh, on in my mind and when Lin Sanity was happening I felt I felt this reveal that I wasn't necessarily comfortable with because I didn't know how to navigate it yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's the difference. You know, the Yao versus Jeremy dichotomy is really instructive here because, like, before someone you, you know be playing basketball or being around people, just walking down the street, someone calls you Yao Ming. Like, yeah, you yeah. know, you know that that's like an insult. <laughs> it's like I'm not yep. seven six. I'm not from China. I'm not this monstrous NBA center. But someone calls you Jeremy Lin, you're like that's like being called Tom Cruise. Yes, like mm -hmm. yes, like a six-three, muscular, <laughs> like well-educated, like very walking successful basketball bucket. player. Yeah, walking fucking bucket. Like, yeah, I, I don't. I'm not offended by that. And that's yeah. just, it's just it's such a rare spot on the approval matrix of <laughs> racial references. Where I'm like, yes, I will gladly accept that. There are a reasonable amount of playgrounds that I used to ball at growing up and when I would be one of the very few white kids playing and you always knew how well you'd done by the comparisons like who did you get when you got when, when you got <laughs> Will Purdue you're like <laughs> <laughs> wow I, uh, I fucked up <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, NBA champion Will Purdue but you're yes. like, you're like uh, can I get a Thunder Dan like I, we'll give you a, we'll give you Wennington <laughs> you may get Brad Miller if you <laughs> like rebound a little better uh, you can get Longley if, you're, if, we're, if we're feeling charitable, but Thunder Dan, I think not. What if someone's like, good game, Hayward. Good game, education reform. How, how would you feel? Uh, I just informed everyone out there. <laughs> uh, yeah, what School is the highest? was in session. What would be the highest compliment? I mean, I'm a Brent Barry guy. I'm a Brent Barry truther. That guy could ball out. Uh, I would agree with you, an unsung hero, but he is not the the, uh, <laughs> the apex compliment. <laughs> right, right. It, it's always Larry Bird, Who, and that's yeah, why. Yeah, right. Of yeah. And that's why the BMM will always mm. prop up Larry Bird because he's the one. He's <laughs> the only white guy in modern history who could ever, arguably, have been the best basketball player on the planet. He's the only one. You know. So when they say <laughs> Luka Doncic versus Larry Bird, that's like that's hallowed ground because. Larry Bird is the only white guy who has ever arguably or arguably held that position. No one else. As great as Nash was, no one thought he was actually the best basketball player on the planet. This Dirk Nowitzki. Me. Dirk Nowitzki, no one thought he was actually Oh, come the best. on. I kind of did. Get, Dirk no is nasty. Wasn't. Dirk is nasty. Get no one ever thought he, either of those guys were better than LeBron James or even Kobe Bryant. No That's one ever believed that. Or Tim Duncan. LeBron James, but, yes. But, I just, I just mean, no one ever thought Dirk or Nash were actually the best human being at basketball ever on the planet at that moment. But Larry Bird <laughs> had that argument. So Doncic being compared to him is the, the ultimate, the ultimate compliment from the BMM. Yeah, no, the the apex Caucasian is is that's a title that I think Bird owns. But I, you know, to bring it semi full circle here, I remember talking to Bob Ryan earlier this week about Jerry West and about being the logo. And it occurred to me then, because I only think in terms of content generation, I was like, <laughs> we could get a decade of takes if the NBA were to say, we are going to elect a new logo. And who should that be? We could argue about that. That's mm. like elect, that's like, you know, I, I don't want to be too um, uh, heretical here, but that's like changing a religious icon. You know, like mm -hmm. who deserves to be on the cross? And I, I think that would perhaps rend our nation apart, but also it would be, to quote the Darren Ravel, you know, I, I feel bad for our nation, but this is tremendous content. <laughs> well, remember after Kobe's death, there was a petition going around that Kobe should be the logo. And he would not be in the top five if I was going to come up with various Quick. criteria. Let's hear him. 
Well, I mean, Allen Iverson is the logo, mm-hmm. so Allen mm-hmm. Iverson would be one. Mm-hmm. And then LeBron and MJ can battle out for number two and three. Uh, you're missing two, buddy. Let's hear to them. Is J.R. Smith on this list? <laughs> I mean, no. Dion Waiters had that iconic pose. Like... <sighs> What I no, it needs to be it needs to be Anthony Mason leaning over the free throw line at an angle that makes you think there was like an editing error, but in yeah, fact yeah. is actually just the intentional design of the logo. Yeah, but I, I actually want to get into this Jerry West idea because I'm now tempted to just start mentioning those guys in all these discussions, even though I've never seen them play. I'm like, cool. Who do you think is the best player of all time? Like Bob Pettit, Bob George Pettit, Mike the best. <laughs> Mike and. I One mean, of the Joneses on that Celtics team, right? <laughs> KC like, look, or Sam, whatever. Yeah, I mean, look, as good as Embiid is and Jokic is, like, they're no George Mikan. <laughs> what 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 why is the Embiid nothing? drill? What's the Embiid drill? Drinking Shirley Temples? Come on. Yeah. Jerry West, he's the logo man. Of course he's the greatest guard of all time. Well, this is an interesting bias thing, right? Because it has to be someone angular who would – identify as a recognizable image it can't be like dwight howard or shaquille o'neal because well shaquille's logo is pretty sweet i gotta admit that like Jokic eating like a fist of cheese it would just be a <laughs> circle uh yeah i mean i do i question when that kobe bryant debate was happening i questioned and they were tearing down all these monuments in the south and i I wondered if I cared as much as I do. And I do care. I've come to the realization that like these symbols mean something to me. But it's all on a spectrum, right? And I think we can definitely dis- discard the, you know, the current Jerry West logo. That's fine with me. I, I don't hold that sacred. But I do hold the NBA in a sacred way. So it's kind of a weird idea. I want I'm, I'm, you... Uh, oh, sorry. Go I, ahead, I was going to say, um, not to step on toes here, but I... I I see this as a quo art project. I don't know how you interpret this. this. I don't know how you interpret it, but I just want to lob that in your general artistic direction. All right, let's let's read let's redo this. We got Eric Spolstra, Jeremy Lin, (laughs) Yao Ming, Jordan Clarkson, Wang Zhu, Nate Robinson, one sixteenth Filipino. He gets on the list. King. Uh, We have uh, Yi Jianlan. I can't even say his last name. I'm a fraud. <laughs> this is this is unacceptable. Um, Yi um, Wang Juju, yeah, he uh, Clippers God. Um, oh, Batir, Batir, right? Oh, Menka Batir, right? He is was a name? yeah, he was a, a large man. Yes. He looked. He reminded me of Pekovic. That who we we have oh, to talk yeah. about Nikola Pekovic. Yeah, yeah. What about uh, Simbular? Simbular. You know, oh, so this is oh. another, by the way, maybe the third rail of the Asian diaspora <laughs> conversation is like, where do our South Asian brothers fit into this conversation? I mean, it's, whew, yeah. I, I don't mean, know if we have time for that one, guys. Yeah, <laughs> I, wa- I watch boxing with my homies, uh, No Simbin, and there's a lot of fighters from like Kazakhstan. And I'm like, are they Asian? Could we do oh, man. this? this my, is roommate, my roommate freshman year of college was Kwanish Yershekovich Batrebekov. <laughs> Wait, and if, if you saw him on the street and I said, hey, that's Andrew Kuo, they'd be like, okay. Like, he's, <laughs> he's a Chinese dude who, yeah. who's Russian. It, like, yep. that's what, not to, again, totally reduce an entire ethnicity, but, like, yep. that's what Kazakhstan in some sects is. Yep. Well, when we went to um, watch uh, Triple G fight yep. at Barclays Center, there was a, a significant population of the crowd there that had a look that you almost never see. Like it's a, it was like a, you know, it's a unique ethnic, like it's profile from people who are of that ancestry from Kazakhstan. And it was like, <laughs> yeah. Kazakhstan. Yeah. And it was I like it. one of every four people walking around Barclays center <laughs> yeah. was someone from there. And normally what are they, one in every 10,000 people? One in, you know, walking around New York City. Yeah. But it, it, it was, this kind of goes back to what we were talking about before with kind of racial, cultural cheerleading. Like, this is their version of Jeremy Lin. Oh, yeah. Like, they're sure. in Barclays Center, you know, singing their songs with their flags. This is, Triple G is their, is their Jeremy. 
And they could have this exact same conversation amongst themselves and be like, yeah, but remember when Triple G came to Barclays? Oh, and imagine, by the way, we were complaining about being referenced uh, compared to Yao Ming. If you're from Kazakhstan, all you get is <laughs> Borat. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. it's and it's and it, I'm again like it's self evidently. I hope people know like Borat is nothing like what people from Kazakhstan are like. But yeah. that's all you get. That's got to be so infuriating. <laughs> I mean, I, I, God, that's so bad. Oh, I'm from uh, Kazakhstan, uh, like Borat, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Like he's not from there. <laughs> like, he's a fictional character. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is from the same man who produced the character of Ali G. Like he is walking so many tight lines that he has been like navigating for decades at this point but whoa like that's a whole different conversation like how do we talk about leg in 2020 yeah right? oh, that's... oh man well i think we've solved racism here today guys, <laughs> guys uh, much to realize. much much God. to my dismay we have ended racism <laughs> <laughs> the worst possible outcome for pablo <laughs> but for the rest of the world a perfect pod Yet again, yet again. Okay. Pablo, thank you for joining us, man. That, that was fun. We should do it again. Yeah, I'm just, I, I would love to anytime. I'm just staring right now at my computer, and I've Google imaged uh, Menke Batir, and I highly recommend yes. everyone does that. That's your homework. <laughs> Google <them. laughs> Pablo, thank you. Cookies. Cookies. Thank you.